screencast, just so people know who are watching the screencast, uh, we didn't capture the basic presentation because it was slowing down some video, but um, we're going to put up the link to the slides um, on the session information on the Drupal Camp uh, LA site, and then we're just going to use this screencast to capture the Q&A part of the presentation for Vasma participatory design. So, Mark, do you want to add stuff about your experience working on it, or? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, like, if, if anybody's interested in the, in the software set that we built, um, you can go to code.bossmob.net, which is just a redirect to GitHub, because all the code is in uh, Git repository. And so you can port our code and, you know, browse through it. And, um, we tried to use like various contrib modules and frameworks that are already available, like the SMS framework and the messaging framework and all these, all these things. But um, in a lot of cases, we needed to make a lot of patches to add features. So that's why we're maintaining it in Git, so you can just like pull it with, with all the patches already applied. Um, and you know, hopefully, our patches will eventually get committed to all the respective contrib modules that that takes a so yeah, I mean it's been it's been really fun to build the site, and um, I'm always interested in finding out if, if other folks here are working on mobile-based projects. I mean, there's just a lot of potential collaboration, and so yeah, if anybody wants to talk about your project, that'd be awesome. Um, any questions? All right, so while Mark's doing that, maybe I'll just sh quickly show, you know, something that's that's up here now. So this is a story, this is a group from Edepska on their way to Berkeley right now from street vendors, magic cleaners, and native green gardening co-op, which are all projects of Edepska, on their way to Berkeley for the National Conference of Worker Cooperatives. That's so funny, Mark, you were going to go to that. Yeah. And then I convinced you to come here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so great, so we're there anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, really? Yeah, it was really expensive. So this is something that was sent um, August 6th at 1.48 p.m. And I'm guessing it's probably a video. Oh, no, it's, a, it's two images. So this is just two slides. And so this was sent from Brenda G., who's somebody who we, we work with in Edepska, from her phone. And then, so you know, she's got this little write-up of what it is that they're doing. Um, which I just actually summarized uh, in English, but so they're on their way to participate in the national conference. Um, and so we have everything from sort of very simple, like a couple images kind of stories that people send to, um, you know, more complicated, you know, like videos that people have edited and then actually upload to, um, you know, oh, this is actually kind of compelling. So this is like a story that one of one of the our community journalists, Made Lu, who does a lot of reporting from the streets of LA. So she does household work, and every day she rides the rapid bus from, um, from Koreatown, where she lives, to the west side, where she um, you know, cleans people's homes for a living. And the other day, she was um, about to board the bus, and she saw this you know, accident that the MTA had, where the Line 204 actually hit this woman. And so she quickly you know, took these photos and you know, did a did a story about it, and the story is not just about the fact that this happened, sort of documenting it, but she also sort of in the story talks about um, um, how she's seen this happen before and how the bus drivers are under a lot of pressure to like meet their schedules, and so it's, she has like this broader analysis that she's trying to put into the story, not just you know, a random picture of, of an accident that happened. Um, she also has been documenting, um, as you know, if any of you who you know, live in LA or Someone was here from Arizona. You know, obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on around SB 1070 in Arizona right now, um, the um, the sort of racial profiling law. And so, Marilu has been documenting a lot of this actions that's been happening in LA, getting really amazing, like firsthand, like real time mobile blogging of um, actions that people have been doing. You know, people have been um, doing direct actions and shutting down the entrance to the federal detention facility. Uh, 
vienes aquí a Los Ángeles? Hola, ella. Ya. ¿Estás tú? Ajá, ya viene de visita. Ah, ¿estás de visita? ¿De dónde vienes? Soy de Guatemala. Ah, mira qué bien. ¿Vienes a Los Ángeles? Sí. Ajá. Ah, ¿Aquí cuánto tiempo en Los Ángeles? Uh, oh, ocho años. Ocho años. Ah. ¿Y tú qué sabes de la SD1070? Ah, muy poco. Solo sé que este, eh, nos están mal informando, como dice mi amiga. Por ejemplo, es una eh, cuestión injusta, racista y todo. And, um... So that's sort of an example of just how the, the what the interface is like for the for the user. The picture is up, but I don't know if it went to the front page automatically. Oh, it's probably in new. So I'm actually because of screen resolution stuff, this is kind of really annoying. Uh, it should be over here. No, it just shows that as being the first one. Uh, is, are you seeing it up? Yeah, I wonder if it has something to do with the multilingual stuff. Oh yeah, that's so that's another thing we've done, right? Like so, this is a multilingual site. But the idea is for them to be able to, you know, present an image of their own, you know, representation to also the English-speaking, you know, blogosphere. So, you know, we're using uh, multilingual stuff. We have a number of people who just translate for the site, so they have. You know, accounts that we've given permissions where they they're not making stories so much, but they log in and then um, if you log in with the right permissions, you'll see a little translate button next to all the stories. So then they translate the stories, and then they can of course be sent and shared out um, across the social web. So you know, we we you know made it easy for people to you know repost these via Facebook, Twitter, um, out to mobile phones, etc. When you do that with Um, it's using the internationalization model, or kind of family model, so that allows you to um, translate different aspects of the site, like menus, blocks, taxonomy terms, nodes, and so you basically, it's a bunch of different sub-models, so whatever you do to go to translate, you just enable those models. If you enable all of them, it's, it's a lot of code, it's kind of loaded, but I mean, it's what you have to do. What was the the model? Internationalization, like I eighteen N, is like the the thing that we go for. So from an ad perspective, you just take a picture and send it to the phone number. Yeah, we don't have a short code for to send content to the site because that's very expensive. So we actually use an email address. It's something at bossmob.net. So you just sent the picture to the email, and yeah. So there was no real admin. Yeah, well, although, I mean, we have different email addresses, so some of them have, you can you, you can set for each email address, you can say, this will be promoted to the front page, or you can even have one that, you know, hides it automatically if you wanted to, okay. so that then it would be, like, approved by an administrator, if you want to do more private site or something. Yeah, and that's a really important point, right? So, um, to buy a short code costs, you know, uh, like eight to ten thousand dollars just to register it, although maybe it's come down a little bit now, and then another a thousand to two thousand dollars per month. So for a small community-based organization, this is obviously not an option. And the reason why it's like that is because who runs the short code registration system? It's just like this industry coalition of all of the phone service providers that has no, like they have no oversight or public input or public interest obligation or anything. So it, it would be as if like, you know, domain name registration was completely run just by a corporate consortium that had no you know, input from, from anybody else. Um, so it's, it's kind of insane, and it's something that we need kind of regulatory action on. But for the, for the moment, since we can't afford to actually you know, buy a short code, um, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that every service pro phone service provider in the US provides free um, SMS and MMS to email gateways, both ingoing and outgoing. So um, we haven't come across one yet that doesn't provide that. And we don't know how much this would scale because obviously, if you had you know thousands or or millions of users, the phone companies would notice and they wouldn't want to pass all that traffic through the gateways they're providing. But so so what that basically means is that 
if you didn't, even if you didn't know it, you can send an SMS or an MMS from your phone, even if it's a cheap prepaid phone without any data plan, um, to an email address, and your, the phone company will basically you know, transport it across from an MMS, convert it to an email, and then forward it on to that email address. And so that's what we're using. So we're basically sending emails to a dedicated mailbox, and then we use MailHandler to go um, check, you know, check the mailbox, pull in all the media files and text that's associated with the, with the post the person has sent, and then we transcode, um, if it's video or audio clips, we transcode it so that it can be you know, presented um, using jQuery. But that was a lot of admin steps. That, that happens all automatically. Were, did you do anything else? Oh, no, that's all automated, yeah. yeah. That's what we've built. So that's the modules that we've developed, and that's what, um, you know, if you want to do that and, and allow, like, mobile blogging into your Drupal site without a short code, then we would love for you to, you know, take the, take the you know, what we've developed and use those, those MMS and SMS filters and add it to your site. Have you experimented with, like, But definitely, um, since outside of the U.S., in most places they don't have free, you know, email to MMS, MMS to email gateways. That is definitely something because as as this project has grown, we start to get more interest from people in other countries where they don't have those gateways. So we are kind of looking into that now and trying to figure out, you know, what would be the best way that we could actually set up our own gateway. There's this project we haven't really played with it that much. This open source MMS gateway called Mbuni that we, uh, there's actually a, a project in India that's about to implement a Vasmov instance there with this nonprofit called um, called Breakthrough that does like a lot of um, women's rights stuff in India. Um, and I think they're exploring Mbuni to see if it's a good sort of solution for us. But if not, it's something we want to do and play with more, but we haven't really done it yet. So currently, um, the, the project isn't designed to be just like a general, like totally open system for anyone to just kind of blog on. It's really designed around um, like community organizations that have a particular you know set of values. Um, basically, they're you know doing community organizing, and so we really are being more intentional right now about who gets to use the site. Um, but at the same time, like the code that we developed doesn't have to be used in that type of situation. So one of the things that we also did work on some was an SMS registration uh, dialogue. So the way that it actually works is the first time you send a message to, Va to Vasmov, um, if you're not a registered user, you'll receive an SMS back that says, hey, thanks for sending a post. Would you like to register an account on the system? If you would, uh, you know, send the name, the username you'd like. And then if the, if the user replies to that, um, we then create an account for them, register them as a blogger, and then send them their password back so that, so that when they get to a computer, they could then log in and edit their stories and have that kind of control. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of one of the requests that we had that came out of those workshops we did, and that is sort of working now. Um, we, it's, again, we're not, we're not trying to get like, sort of everybody and just random people to use the site right now. It's really like supposed to be like customized around the needs of 
basically folks who don't have access to computers right now. We're really trying to build a space for, for them where all of the, the code that we develop and the way that it works is all built around you know, that particular use case. But um, if you want to try and set up your own instance, that would be awesome. You could get it from code.vasmob.net, and there's no reason why someone couldn't make a totally open you know, uh, mobile blogging social network site that was, that was open to everyone. Um, and the SMS registration you know, is working now, so it's kind of cool. I mean, we, we built on like existing modules with that, but um, it was funny because the way that a lot of SMS registration works so far, it's it's like um, what was it? They just sent you a, like a login and a pass. So the the the, the model was the, the reason why participatory design was was sort of useful and interesting in that particular use case is a lot of people who do mobile registration, it's assumed that the person is is like registering on a computer first, and then they're just trying to add a phone to their account, right? This is how, typically how social networking sites would work. So you would, you would log in at your computer, create your profile, and then you'd add your phone by like typing in your phone number, and it would send you a kind of confirmation message. But our use case is really different from that. So again, for people who just came in, like this is a use case of people who don't have computer access. Their only form of connectivity is the phone. And so we need to be able to just directly register them via the phone, and then later, if they can get access to a computer, maybe in a library or a community center, um, they'll be able to log in and edit their stories, but if they can't, they're still already registered and can start sending stories and actually be a blogger on the site without um, ever having to access the computer first. Hey, Shelf. You're able to do all this through the email and SMS gateway? Yeah, because every phone has an email address. So, you know, like if you have a variety of phone, then it's just the phone number at vtax.com. So, if we, if, if we have the Drupal site send an email to, to that number at vtax.com, then the user is going to get the message and it'll, it might say reply to this message. And then they can reply to it and it'll go back to whatever email address was on the front header of the email. So, we can send and receive emails in, in sort of like a dialogue fashion back and forth. I wanted to give another example of. Um, so we also did workshops with the Southern California Library, and Michelle here works with them. Um, so we did a workshop with them last summer where this was a group of uh, young people. Um, and we sort of tried to work with them to see like, well, what kind of stories would they tell about their community in South Los Angeles you know, using these phones? And they did um, you know, some interesting stories, kind of like PSA type stuff too. Um, but I think... Keep your teens off drugs. Did you know that last year, 47.4 of high school seniors in the U.S. admitted to having tried drugs, and that 20% of eighth graders, 13 year old, also tried drugs? Please, parent, teach your kids not to do drugs. So this was an interesting experience, and it was a very different use case than the um, the day laborers that we actually built the system with. And some things were really great about that project, but I think some things like didn't work that well. And I think we can like learn a lot from those experiences too, especially in the context of talking about participatory design. So one of the things was the group of teenagers, like they all already had their own phone, like they had like sidekicks with like unlimited messaging plans, and they were already, you know, on MySpace especially, um, you know, posting lots of media content and sending it, you know, between each other and to the web. And so for them, I think so one of one of the things because someone had asked a question earlier about like what's the sort of workflow. And so one of the requests with that was was like to actually have some sort of editorial like intentionality about what stories would be posted. So basically not everything they were sending was immediately posted to the blog. And I think because they were already so used to sending lots of multimedia content around via the phones they already had, I don't think it really worked for them. Like they weren't that into it because why would you be so into a mobile blogging system where it was basically like wasn't immediately published and available if you could just immediately send it to your you know MySpace page and all of your friends would see it right away. So there's these like complicated you know things that you have to negotiate um, based on the particular use case. Even though we had built like technically the system worked fine, right? In terms of what this particular group of people wanted to do with the site, we had built it around the needs of this other group of people that had a very different experience of creating content and interacting with the web weren't on social networking sites, weren't already you know, posting stuff you know, online. So um, 
I guess that's one of the lessons that we learned there is that you can't just assume that you know, you've, you've built a site that works really well technically, but it just may not work with that particular use case. So if we were, had to do that over, I would say we would actually really start from the beginning, not just trying to teach them to use the system we had built, but we would start from, okay, how do you want your um, like interactions with the site to, to really work? And they probably would have come up with some interesting things that, that the day laborer group didn't think of that um, we could have then you know, prioritized for Mark to, you know, to implement in the code. Is that, yeah. is that fair? Like, yeah. That's true, and I think the part of the issue is like, like you just said, what stories are like, how, you know, how are they made in a story? And I think it's going to work as a part and not just the plot. Definitely. Does anyone else have an experience with participatory design that they want to you know, talk about or share? Or maybe you don't call it participatory design, but in how you interact with a community you're trying to build a site for, or a client, or, you know. <laughs> Other than you work with a corporation and everybody's got to put their hand in there, you sort of assign one person and then all of a sudden everybody speaks up. And you start, oh, this, this department wants this, and this department wants this. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, that's, and that happens in any context, right? So in this context, it's not like um, all the day laborers and household workers who we built the site with, they're not like this monolithic mass of day laborers and household workers, right? They're people, it's like Marilu and Manuel and Marco and Crispine, and they all have different ideas, I mean, you know, about how they want the site to work and what they want it to look like. And, and so part of it is really just this consensus building process, which can be applied in any situation from a corporate client to a community-based organization. It's like, how are you gonna work with a group of people to figure out together um, in a way that feels right and fair to everyone, you know, what the site's gonna look like, what type of features you're gonna prioritize, and do it in a way that people will really feel ownership over the process and be able to buy into it, and then also hopefully, you know, produce really interesting you know, maybe, it'll, well, maybe it'll even produce some interesting new functionality that you never would have thought of, even though you're a brilliant, you know, developer or designer or, or whatever, the community that you're working with or the client that you're working with, um, they might actually have, you know, really good ideas. And so it's how do you, how do you figure out which ones to prioritize, you know, together with them. Um, and that's what we've been sort of trying to play with and experiment with over the last couple of years. And the thing that I would say what has worked really well for us is like a lot of face-to-face -face meetings a lot of um, games and workshops where we do things like paper mock-ups and cutouts and like so we did this thing where once we got to the wireframe stage based on the features that they wanted based on looking at other existing sites we had them cut out you know printouts of like a bunch of their stories like lots of their photos and stuff and then actually fill up you know fill up those wireframes um, with those photos so they could actually see what the site might look like because the people who don't do web design already a wireframe is like What's that? It's like a random bunch of lines on the paper that doesn't actually, they're not like used to thinking about, okay, how am I gonna get from this wireframe to the completed design? So to actually have them put their hands you know, on them with paper mock-ups and charrettes, that's how we actually came to consensus about, okay, which one, which direction are we gonna go? And we did that over a series of a couple months with, with like multiple sort of games and workshops um, where they did things like the paper cutouts, the heart, you know, the heart system where they're putting literally physically putting sticky hearts on other sites like on the features that they like and the colors that they like um, and then in the feature set again just like over time really just just sitting down with them face to face and being like okay what's working for you about the site what's frustrating you and then getting that into an issue tracking system has been totally crucial for us like we're using Redmine you could use whatever you want to use but um, I just think that's really kind of crucial, especially if you're doing a, a development process over time, because some issues like keep coming up repeatedly and then you know those issues get sort of bumped up into higher and higher priority and that's how we know how to like organize the development time. Because again, you know, we're working on a shoestring here, right? Like we're not we're not V C funded, we have some like foundation supporting us. And so like everything that we've done with the site, I don't I think we've spent like a total of like thirty thousand dollars or something like that. 
um, on the development over a period of two years on, on everything, like including design and new features and new modules were released and like everything. And that's a lot for a community-based organization, but that's like nothing for a, a web startup, a social networking site, like to build, like to build all this functionality that we have um, in, in, an, in a sort of like VC setting. I don't know, like you've worked on like corporate sites and stuff, like how, mu how much would people spend to like build all that stuff that we've done? Well, I don't know, this should have been a million dollar project, I would say. Yeah. I think we're running out of time, but okay. one thing I wanted to say was, I mean, I, I, to me, like, there's a lot of, I mean, this was basically the first project I worked on where it was, like, you know, intentionally like a participatory design process and was actually a paying project for me. I mean, I volunteered on, on sites before that were very participatory and how they were set up. But, um, but I mean, I think like, there's a lot of crossover with um, with uh, agile methodology in terms of, I mean, kind of tell just in terms of having these workshops where everybody's in the room together and you know using paper speakings and things like that. Um, and I, I think it's really important for people to really be in the same room. I think that's and that was actually hard for me because I, I'm in the Bay Area, so I don't get down to LA that often. And um, I want to just put out there that we're totally looking for LA based develop developers who are in Boston. Mom. So if anybody is a developer or you know somebody who, who's um, getting to your goal, um, talk to Sasha or me. Because we're, we're always looking for local developers who can you know, meet with the team in the workshops and improve the site over the next year. Because as you can see, we have over 500 outstanding issues and feature requests that have been generated by this process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing that we need to do is also, um, like, uh, basically get more of, you know, we want to be more visible, like, on Drupal.org, and so, like, we really need to do a better job, I think, of, like, we are going to create a project page. Um, we're just about to do, we're going to release a, um, we were talking about doing an installation profile, but we may do that, but I think we're going to do a Drush make file first. Um, and basically just like being more visible on Drupal.org and so that some of the outstanding like bugs especially that we find, like we can use DO, like bug, you know, bug tracking and issue tracking system on the modules that we're building on, I think more effectively to get other people to you know, fix some of the stuff that we're coming across. So we're working on that too. And I, I think this is probably another session coming in, right? So. Yeah. All right, so thanks, you guys. Oh, and come to the mobile birds of a feather this afternoon if you want to do more mobile stuff. Uh, I don't know, it's on the schedule. <laughs> Were you able to do the screencast? Um, I was, except for uh, the screencast software made it impossible for me to show a video I was going to show. 